Hello, my name is Nicholas Bira. I am the current 3D Printing Club president, and I am going to be going over a few different sculpting tools and mesh mixer, as well as detailing how to use the different options under each tool. Today I'm going to be going over how to use the sculpting tool in Autodesk Mesh Mixer. I'm going to start out by importing the bunny again like I did in the introduction video and I will also be adding in an additional sphere off to the side so that I can better demonstrate what some of these tools do. So starting out I'm going to open up the sculpting tab on the left here and when you go up to the top menu you have all these different tools that you can use to change and remodel your mesh. Starting out with the drag tool, you have all these other options on the left underneath of it that allow you to modify how the tool works. So you have the fall off button which affects the general shape of the object being being dragged. So if I have this flat surface it has a bit of a plateau shape whereas if I have the spike surface it has a much more pointy shape. So to demonstrate that really quickly, I'll just do something like this, have kind of a plateau shape, go into spike, has much more pointy shape to it. I prefer to go with just plateau for most of the things I'm doing. This generally gets the job done. So I'll undo those two. And next you have color. This doesn't really matter. This is just for visual help if you want to color different areas while you're also sculpting them. I personally never use that. These two things here, the strength and the size, are the most important when editing the, the capability of your tool. If I go to strength, I can increase it all the way up to 100, and this is how strongly or how quickly it will react to your direction. If I do the size, that will affect the overall size of the tool, so that when I do the same commands multiple times you'll get different results. So here you can see I had 100 strength and three different sizes. If I go to three different sizes on a much lower strength it will take a lot more time to accurately move it. With the drag tool it's a little less obvious how strength factors in since you are just moving your mouse to to use the tool but if I Go to next, the next tool, uh, Draw for example, this will demonstrate that a little better. So Draw essentially pulls out the mesh in the direction of your camera. So if I click and hold down, it'll slowly start to inflate and drag this in the direction of the camera. If I go to this side, you can see it's drawn it all the way out in that direction. Again, the size and the strength will dictate how, how well or how far that goes. Uh, I'll lower this a bit and lower the strength to slow that down. Again, slightly smaller draw in the direction of the camera. If I go into draw plus plus, it's the same as draw except it's a little bit faster, a little bit more aggressive. The flatten tool I will show here essentially looks at all the different surfaces and then tries to make a plateau on the on the top highest point of the surrounding area. So for example on this rabbit here you have some mild bumps on the leg. If I increase the size of this a bit and hold it down, essentially it creates a very flat surface on the area that I'm holding down and, and covering and will smooth out around the edges of the area that I was focusing on. If I do it in a valley like here it's a little more obvious what I'm doing. So it's kind of like smoothing in a way but it, it doesn't just smooth out the differences, it creates a, a very flat circular area if I hold it down for extra long. Going on to the inflate button, this is sort of like draw except that it doesn't just extrude outward in the direction of the camera, it inflates outward in all directions when you hover over an area. So if I do it here you'll see that, uh, that's a bad example, I will undo that and try again. I'll lower the strength so it's a little less speedy. If I do that for a little bit you can see the top and the bottom part of the body and the leg are both inflating and there's this crease in between the two where the valley, the little groove used to be. And again this this is a 
useful for certain applications where draw is not if you want to retain the overall shape of something uh, without changing, but uh, by also increasing it, but not changing the valleys or grooves. The next tool is the pinch tool, which will take all of the triangles and sort of bring them together into a, a point. So if I hold it down here, you can sort of see that moving. Let me do it in a better area here. This, this sort of draws everything into the area of, of the click where I'm pointing. It ha doesn't have very many common uses, but sometimes if you need to bring a mesh inwards, uh, this is certainly useful at bringing things into a sharp point. So the next tool is the move tool. And unlike draw or inflate, which actually alter the, the mesh itself, move essentially just takes the area that is covered by my tool and allows you to just physically move it where you need it to be. So this is great if you want to move a section like the head here, for example, without changing it, but you want everything else to adapt around it. So I'm just going to click on this and try to drag as much of it as possible. This is a poor example since the move tool I'm using doesn't quite encompass the entire head. If I make the bunny smaller, then I could do it. I'll do it on the ear. This should be a little more obvious. So here I've managed to move the ear up while retaining the connection with the rest of the body. The top of the ear is about the same, but the in-between area that got stretched is different now. Moving on to the spike tool, this allows you to do exactly that, make spikes. It's really just a derivation of the draw tool, except it's much more rapid. And I use this for making a bunch of small things. You want to add texture to a certain surface. You can do a small size, lower strength, and you can really just make a lot of bumps or spikes quickly. If you're wanting to do real spikes, again, it helps to use the spiky falloff or the bump falloff since they are a little more pointed and might get you the look you're looking for a little faster. So then I like to go through with a few other tools. There's some tools that I never use, but I will always be using the refine and reduce tools. Refine take a, takes a mesh like this sphere, for example. And if you zoom in, you can see all of the different triangles located on the surface of the mesh. And if you go to the sculpt tab and you use refine with a strength of 100, for example, what this does is it subsamples all those triangles and makes it even more dense. Uh, you can't really see it here, but it's very, very refined. There's a lot of triangles in that area now. Reduce does the opposite, where if I click on this area, it actually downsamples all the triangles, reducing the overall tessellation and the complexity of the object. So here I have a very high density mesh, and here I have a very low density mesh. Both have their uses. If I were to inflate this area, it would go very gradually and have a very smooth clean fall off as you can see there whereas if I inflate this area it has much more triangulation and generally less uh, clean fall off. So both have their uses generally if you increase the tessellation here by re reduce or refining then you'll have a much higher um, size of a file and the file will be much harder to work with or export. So generally you want to go with lower tessellation if you can but sometimes you need the higher tessellation to get a good quality model. So the last few sculpting tools I like to use are the Bubble Smooth, Shrink Smooth, and Robust Smooth. These three tools are all very similar except they do slightly different things. The main one is Robust Smooth, which goes through your model and just smooths out any little bumps, tiny little imperfections by looking at the surrounding surrounding material and filling it in as necessary. Where there's an area with a lot of sharp features, this is not as useful because it definitely reduces that. As you can see, I'm smoothing out the entire face of this rabbit. But on the back side, where it was much more rounded and there was less detail, it was really nice for getting a, a nice smooth polish on the area, like, like you can see here. If I go to the Shrink Smooth, it does the same thing, except that it also reduces and shrinks inward as I'm doing it. So here we have, I'm not sure you can see it. I will increase the strength. Hopefully that'll make it more obvious. 
Yeah, so on the back side here, I'm smoothing, but I'm also reducing the overall volume of this solid when I do it this way. So again, different, different applications, uh, but they both accomplish roughly the same thing. The bubble smooth is some combination of the two, essentially filling in divots by smoothing out as you go. So through those three smoothing tools, you can get, generally get a very nice final version of your, your model that you're looking for. It's usually a last step in a modeling procedure. Uh, the last tool that I sometimes use, but is a little more tricky to get the hang of, is zipper edge. So for example, if I remove a, a region of this rabbit by selecting this area, pressing X to delete it, I can go into the Sculpt Tool tab and use Zipper Edge and essentially cover over this area and click and it will recognize that it's kind of an edge that needs to be closed up and it will do its best to recompute and move the edges together. So while it's closed up that hole I made, it still has a small, like, small cut in the side of it and it needs to be actually analyzed with an inspector to address that. So again, like I did in the first video, you can use Analyze Inspector tool and it'll find that crack and heal it really quickly. And I can also close off the bottom, which I hadn't done previously. So Zipper Edge is very useful for when you're combining multiple objects or you have a rough connection and you need to bring all the, the joints together, so to speak, to close it up. But that generally does a good job. So that's all the tools uh, I was going to go over today. I recommend that you all try them out for yourselves, mess around with them, and definitely explore the other options like depth and laziness, which have a more nuanced effect on the overall tool, but are certainly useful for getting understanding of how this works. One last tool that I forgot to mention is the symmetry tool. This is actually very, very important. If you're working on something that you want to have uh, symmetry about any axis, it's very useful that you, you select that tool and define with the options tab, define where that symmetry plane is. So my rabbit isn't symmetrical because it, it's turning its head to one side, but if I wanted to add sym symmetrical additions to it, I could define the plane of symmetry right down the middle, press accept. And then when I do any further tools like draw, for example, it will do it on both sides of the plane of symmetry. And so example is like this, I'm drawing spines on both sides, both sides of my model, and it's repeating it on both sides of the plane of symmetry, uh, allowing me to much more quickly make something that looks a little more natural than if I were to try and make all these spikes exactly the same way on both sides of the, the plane of symmetry. However, for the head, which is turned to the side, this doesn't really work because it, it's trying to see a, a space that's the same on the other side, but it doesn't actually have anything to build off of, so it doesn't work as well. That is all I had to cover today. Uh, thank you for watching, and please stick around and watch the next video in the series, part two, which should be linked at the end of this video. Thanks. Thanks for watching this video by 3D Printing Club. If you like this video, go ahead and leave a like or a comment. Be sure to subscribe or check out one of our other videos. Thanks.